Carmichael Library. I'm Amanda Melcher, the president of the Montevallo branch of AAW, and it's my immense pleasure to introduce our speakers along with this very important part of our history. A quick warning, today's subject matter, language and photographs may be distressing for some people. Also, if our program extends beyond five, please feel free to leave if you need to. In the spring semester of 2018, AAUW welcomed two representatives from the Equal Justice Ini Initiative. EJI was founded in 1989 by Brian Stevenson, a public interest lawyer and author of the book Just Mercy. EJI is a private, sorry, nonprofit organization that provides legal representation to people who have been illegally convicted, unfairly sentenced, or abused in state jails and prisons. In addition to this critical work, EJI also started a campaign, campaign called the Community Remembrance Project to recognize the victims of lynching by collecting soil from lynching sites, erecting historical markers, and creating a national memorial that acknowledges the horrors of racial injustice. EJI has documented more than 4,400 4, racial terror lynchings in 12 southern states. To quote Brian Stevenson, we should not accept the silence that has accompanied our history of racial inequality and racial injustice. So again, it's my honor to introduce our speakers, um, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge a few special guests that we have in the audience. First of all, Welcome to Ms. Barbara Bilal, a longtime Montevallo resident, author, and AAEW member. Worked with the library with me for many years. Very dear to our hearts. Um, I'd also like to welcome Elvin Lane with the Black Belt African American Genealogy and Historical Society. Right there. And Barbara's right beside him. Um, and finally, I'd like to welcome the Historical Marker Coalition Project Coalition co-leader, Dr. Paul Mahaffey. He's toward the back. Today's presentation will bring forth three perspectives on the terror of lynching. The first from UN Professor Kathy Lowe. Ms. Lowe began researching John Stillman in 2008. She received a faculty research grant and visited the special collections at UNC Chapel Hill Libraries. This research led to the discovery of Dr. Stillman's case studies of the Tuscaloosa lynching in August of 1933. Our second guest will be Ms. Deborah Harton, Harton Love. Mr. A.T. Harden is Ms. Love's great uncle. Mr. Harden was, Mr. Harden, I'm so sorry, was lynched in August 1933 in Bibb County. Kathy Lowe will provide more information about Ms. Love and their personal connection. Our third guest, Dr. Kathy King, is a literary historian with a particular interest in what has been left out of history. Since her retirement from UN, she started paying more attention to the exclusion of African Americans from the town's history. This led her to an awareness of two lynchings in Montevallo. She became a founding member of the coalition together with Dr. Sierra Turner and Dr. Paul Mahaffey to bring a monument to Montevallo. Please welcome Kathy Lowe. Okay, I want to say thank you, Amanda. Um, we mentioned pictures. I have some pictures that are from Dr. Stillman's files of lynchings. Um, these are difficult to look at. They might be disturbing, so use your discretion. So I'm going to start passing them around, okay? Um, I might take this off. Okay, here we go. Um, also, you have a handout. It's a census record, okay? Um, at the, on one side, the name is Dan A. Pippins. This is a 1930 United States federal census record. Dan Pippins was murdered in August of 1933 by a white mob. 
<coughs> also, that at that same time, you turn it over, Mr. A.T. Harden, Miss Love's great uncle, was also murdered. I just wanted to pass this out to let you all remember, these are people with families. And they're going to get upset. And they're gone. They're gone through violence. violence. So I just wanted to hand that out and let you all kind of remember and see their names in print. OK, so how did I come about this? <laughs> I started looking at Dr. John Roy Steelman. He taught here uh, from 1928 to 34. He was a sociology professor. Um, he became involved with the Southern Commission on the Study of Lynching. This was a committee formed in 1930 as part of a larger group. But what the, the objective was to send professionals out into each state in the South professional sociologists. They would pair up a white sociologist like Dr. Steelman with a black sociologist. In this area, it was someone from Morehouse College named Dr. Shivers. And if you know um, Dr. Fallon here on campus, he was a student of Dr. Shivers at Morehouse. So we have a lot of connections. So he, his job was to secretly investigate lynchings in the hopes to make a report and maybe even stop them. The case that um, Dr. Stillman was greatly involved with was the case study. He, he was part of looking into this and trying to do the best he could. But June 1933 in, the state, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Vaudeen Maddox, um, she left home for a neighbor's house. On June 14th, two days later, she was found dead, murdered, in Tus rural Tuscaloosa County. Two days later, uh, Dan Pippen Jr., who was 18 years old, is arrested as a suspect. June 18th, two days later, A.T. Harden, who's about 15 years old, was arrested as a suspect. On June 21st, 1933, Dan Pippen and Mr. Harden were transferred to Birmingham jail for safekeeping. They were being held in the Tuscaloosa City Jail. A few days later, um, the, one of the reasons they were moved is because there was a mob forming um, and was intent upon lynching them. So those two young men were moved and the mob did get into the Tuscaloosa jail and demand that Circuit Court Judge Henry B. Foster and Sheriff Shamblin allow two mob leaders to go through the jail. They didn't believe that the, the, the young men had been moved and so they had to prove it. Um, a couple of days later, a third person is accused of the murder. Um, Mr. Elmore, also known as Honey Clark, he was about 28 years old, and so he's arrested. So now all three have been arrested, and by June 24, 1933, all three are indicted for the murder of Audie Maddox. Saturday, go forward a couple of months, August 12th, um, they've been indicted, but there's no trial yet. Uh, rumors are prevalent that the three men would be taken from the jail and lynched that night. So, um, Rumors were, you know, of course, prevalent all the time. Um, but I guess they felt that it was time to move them. Or, of course, there might have been a plan in place. So 7 o'clock that night, Judge Foster stops by the jail and confers with Sheriff Shamblin. And it was agreed that Pippin, Harden, and Clark would be transferred to Jefferson County for their safety. By 8 o'clock that night, Judge Foster calls the jail. And the men are still in the jail. 9 p.m., Judge Foster calls again and learns that the men still have not left the jail. 9.30, the three men are placed in a car with three deputies, Pate, Holman, Huff, and start towards Birmingham. At 1.30 a.m., the deputies return to Tuscaloosa with the report that they had been overtaken by a mob of 12 men and that the prisoners were gone. Dr. Steelman, um, he made a report of this, so um, he, that's who was recording all of these, this information was Dr. Steelman. Sunday morning, August 13th, the sheriff from Tuscaloosa requests officers from three other counties to investigate the lynching. There's no trace of any mass mob. About 10 a.m., the bodies of Mr. Pippen and Mr. Harden are found, and they were found near Woodstock, Alabama, which is in Bibb County, very close to a lot of, of county borders. 
Tuscaloosa, Bibb County. Um, both bodies bore the, bore the marks of several shots. <coughs> Mr. Clark is missing, and an intensive search for him begins. <coughs> Dr. Steelman writes that the lynchings were generally satisfactory to Tuscaloosa's white people, and at this time, they thought, with Harden, Pippin, and Clark out of the way, the entire blame for the whole situation is heaped on the outsiders. And um, that meant the communists, uh, the Inter International Labor Division, I think, or department. That was the judicial arm of the Communist Party. The Communist Party played quite a role here in the 30s in Alabama. And they were quite involved with the Scottsboro case, too. So it was easy to blame the communists for, for what had all happened. Well, Monday morning, Mr. Clark is found alive near Vance, Alabama. He had struggled and wandered into the yard of Maddie, Maddie Braxter, a widow with five children. She finds some neighbors to help. They find Mr. They take him towards Tuscaloosa, and Dr. Mitchell, a black physician, arrives to tend to Mr. Clark. And he went without any first aid for quite some time. Mr. Clark had the opportunity to testify, not in front of a court, but he, he, he had an affidavit. He, was, he made it to Atlanta, Georgia. He was at Morehouse College, and he made it. I, I'll read a little bit from his affidavit. But basically, Mr. Clark says, when they started out with us, we thought something was going to happen. And Dr. Steelman reports that, in, in, in the context of this event, all the officials were exonerated. All the lynchers were left unmolested. And nobody was surprised at the outcome. My connection to Miss Deborah Love and EJI, um, you can kind of tell 2016, I still have these files with case studies, and there's names in these files. And I didn't really know what to do with them. Um, long story short, his stepson gave them to me, um, and we have some of the files. But I wasn't really sure what to do. Um, I wrote an article, you know, I, taught, I gave several talks around town sometimes. But I, I started to think, I wonder if somebody would like to know more about this. And so I actually emailed EJI and said, this is what I have. And would you like to come see what I have? And they said yes. So on March 5th, 2017, um, a little bit before that, EJI, uh, Evan Mitchell, is it? Evan, uh, Milligan. Milligan. Thank you. And Jonathan, <laughs> he's from Rwanda. Some of you all met him at Parnell uh, a couple weeks ago. But it was EJI who put me in touch with Deborah. And Deborah met with me in my office, and I gave her copies of the Steelman files. And those files contain the details of what happened to her great uncle in the summer of 33. And I'm just going to read an excerpt of what happened. This is Mr. Clark's testimony. On the night we were lynched, when the deputy started out with us, I knew something was going to happen to us. The deputies did not say a word. They just drove through country roads, winding around and around for a time. After we started driving from the Tuscaloosa jailhouse, we drove around for a while and finally stopped. When we came up to a Ford car that looked like it had something wrong with it, and the deputies got out of the car and went up and talked to somebody. In a little while, the deputies came back and got back in the car, and we drove around for a little while longer. And then we stopped again, but there wasn't anybody around where we stopped, except us. And the deputies got out of the car, took a rifle, and looked at it, and walked around behind the car. And they were shaking their heads, and in a few minutes, they came and got back in the car, and we rode on again. After a while, they stopped the car and told us to get out. Two deputies got out with us. Deputy Pate, who had been driving all the time, said he would have to go back to Tuscaloosa and get some papers. But they couldn't carry us to the Birmingham jail without papers. So Deputy Pate took the car and rode off. We waited by the side of the road and with the two deputies with us. They didn't say anything except one said, this would be a good woods to pass and hunt in. We waited there about a half an hour maybe, and two cars drove up. They drove on past us about 100 yards and turned around and came back. Mr. Pate's car was one of those that stopped in front and the other car behind. A man got out of the back car with a pistol. One of the deputies who had waited with us said, you boys get back in that car. 
The two deputies got in the front car with Mr. Pate. There were five white men in the car with us. Three in the front, two in the back, and then three of us. We drove around Mr. Pate's car and left him standing there. They made us hold our heads down, so I didn't see Mr. Pate and the other deputies anymore. We rode about a mile and came to another car that had the lights turned on across the road. The car we was in drove by this car, and one of the men was riding with us and said, All right, come on, we got him. So this car pulled in behind us. We never did see any more of Mr. Pate and the other deputies. I don't know whether they followed us or not, because we had to hold our heads down. Anyhow, directly, we got a puncture on the left front wheel on the car we was driving in, and they made us keep our heads down while they fixed it. Some men came up from a car that was behind us and helped fix the puncture. When we drove on up the road, a little piece, we came to a car standing in front of us. When we pulled up behind it and blowed two times, the front car pulled on ahead of us, and we turned our lights on dim and followed it. In a little while, all the cars stopped, and we got out, and we was marched into the woods. I tried to look back, and it looked like a lot, a lot of men were coming with us. Of course, I had been knowing for about an hour that something was going to happen to us. One of the men said, this is far enough, turn around. I don't know how many of them lined up, but several. One said, you all can have the others, but I'll take this big nigger. About that time, he blazed away and shot me in the arm first. I fell and pulled the others down because I was handcuffed to them. As I fell, lots of them shot us. I don't know how long I was dead, but when I came to, blood was all over me, and the two boys were lying across me, and they were stiff and cold. I pushed them off and wiped the blood out of my face. So, um, again, part of this is, this is, you know, Dr. Steelman's report, and I had, EJI put me in touch with Deborah, and um, it was, I can't tell you how touching it is to be able to reach out to her family and help her understand and read exactly what happened and to know the truth. So I'd like for you to meet Miss Deborah Love. It's really touching. And like Kathy said, families. And if you take your sheet with the 1930 census and you look at it, I would like to explain a little bit about this. First of all, I would like to talk about Dan Pippins. My mother, who is 93 years old, uh, was eight at the time that this happened. She knew A.T. very well. She also knew Dan and she knew Honey, as they called Mr. Clark. She said the day that that happened, although it was 80 something years ago, it is just like it was yesterday. Growing up, she told us a little bit about it, that she had an uncle who was lynched. And as we got older, she told us a little bit more. But one of the things that I found out when I went to <laughs> A.T.'s brother's funeral, see, you don't know, A.T. had a brother. If you look at the 1930 census, you won't know that because he was actually staying with his grandmother at that time. A lot of my relatives at A.T.'s brother's funeral in 2016, January of 2016, was not aware of the situation. So a lot of family members over the years internalized it, wouldn't talk about it. But my mother talked about it and told us about it. She said she would never forget that Sunday morning. She would never forget when she found out about this case and what happened to, to A.T. 
Can you imagine that the reason that they gave for arresting Dan, that he had a funny look on his face. That was the reason to arrest him. It's still unclear why they arrested A.T. and why they arrested Honey. But they had families. And families who hurt, even today, and especially when you don't talk about it. That's the reason the markers and collecting soil sample is so important. We went out to the Woodstock area in 2017. I think it was March of 2017. As a matter of fact, it was March 7th, 2017. And we collected soil samples. My mother was there. But we could actually just feel that. And we could, we could watch her and just see that it was just really a hurt. I experienced that same sight when at the Equal Justice Memorial and the lynching, the lynching memorial, where she stood there and she looked at his name. And just that pain is just still here. Can you imagine a 15-year-old, a 15-year-old, innocent, and all of this is going on. When we were over in the Woodstock area, I said, it was dark. Can you imagine back in this area how they felt? How frightened. So that's the reason I think that this whole project with Eve is so important. A lot of people don't understand it. But if you stand in my shoes, and especially my mother's shoes, you will understand. Because for so many years, it's like they didn't exist. They were human beings. You know, they were young. Dan Pippins was the only child his parents had. The only one. And so can you imagine what their life was like after that? Um, if you look at if you look at the 1930 census and you see Dan Pippins and you see his mother and his father and then you see Dan Pippins at the age, in 1930, the age of 14. If you look at A.T. Hardin, okay, Bud Hardin, which was my great-grandfather, we called him Dead Bud. Phyllis Hardin, Phyllis F-I-L-L-I-E-S is P-H-Y-L-L-I-S. That was my great-grandmother. And then you had A.T. Hardin. And then the last name, Otis Nevins. Otis was my mother's first cousin who mother died in childbirth. So his grandmother was raising him. My mother talked about days. She was eight, he was 15. But can you imagine playing, having conversations with a cousin or an uncle that closely related to you? There was a lot of communication and then all of a sudden, he's gone. But I can say because of the project of collecting the soil samples, also looking at Markers. We are searching for a place now to actually place a marker for A.T. and Dan Pippins. That starts the healing process. It starts the healing process. Because it's not something that families forget about. They live with this every day. I mean, every day. And unless you walk in those shoes, then some people don't think, why is, why is the memorial there? I've heard of that. And it's for families like my family. But it's also 
for the world to understand because one of the things we can't hide and but we have to talk about the past because we have to make sure that we don't repeat it so we have to have open conversations about it it's really important so that will not happen again and I can't hide it. I can't pretend like it never existed. My mother, who's 93 years old, she can't. So can you imagine holding all of that in, not being able to, not talking about it. People just didn't talk about it. Because that was the big sandy area of Tuscaloosa County, which is close to Malibu. People don't talk about it. But people thought about it and it was eating away. You know, I think about A.T.'s brother. Most people had no idea he had a brother. I've read some articles, he was the only child. Not true, not true. Had a brother who died in 2016. So, when I look at all of the counties and how they want to put markers and they want to really bring the replica to put in their county is history. It's what happens and it's something that we really need to really need to embrace because so many people, <coughs> it helps so many people to deal with the hurt because now it's not, it's not like he never existed because you can actually see his name. So, that's all um, I have for right now. I'll probably think of something else to say in a few minutes, but um, um, Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kathy Key. Thank you, Deborah. Um, this is a slide of the Shelby County uh, monument at, at, uh, in Montgomery. And I'm going to be talking today about the two people here at the head of the list. You'll notice if you can read it. Their names are unknown. And a theme is developing here, uh, the theme of family. The role of family in the remembrance of these events. Um, I'm going to be talking about a very different kind of lynching and its impact. One, a lynching that occurred 40 years ago, uh, or 40 years before the, the lynching in Deborah's family, um, and that occurred right here in Montevallo. This was in 1889. And uh, I want to tell you in as much detail as I can everything I've been able to learn about that lynching. Um, I should say that until very recently, um, lynching was something I knew about from photographs. And like many of you, I'm sure, I would look at them. They were black and white. They were distant. They happened somewhere else. They were horrible. But the mind is a wonderful thing. It keeps us sane by turning off those horrible, horrible impressions. And so lynching was something that happened over there. When you go to Montgomery, if you haven't been yet, Deborah showed us the slide of the soil collection jars. There's one that says Montevallo. It will hurt, I promise you, when you look at that. Um, and it was, it was my experience in, Mont in uh, Montgomery, seeing that jar, talking to people there, that made me want to learn everything I could about lynchings here in Shelby County. So, um, without any further ado, I have scripted remarks so that I can stay to, ready for this, 10 minutes and 11 seconds. <laughs> so that's what we have coming before us here. Um, so, let's start with the story. On a Saturday night, in late August 1889, two African-American males were hanged from a tree on Main Street. They were thought to have murdered a young white man the night before. 
the tree, long gone, stood in front of the family <coughs> residence at the corner of Main and Shelby, across from the present city hall and just this side of Shoal Creek. Most of y'all should have a handout with a map of, of Montebello, which will help dealing with the geography here. Um, the site is now a paved parking lot. The trouble began the previous night when John Lawrence, just 25 and recently married, interrupted a burglary in Latham's General Store, and you'll see that on the map there, uh, where he worked. Some of you remem may remember it as Rogan's Store. We have natives of Montevallo who, who remember Rogan's Store. Um, that's where the burglary was interrupted and the murder occurred. It is now a martial arts studio. Many of you all will recognize that. Sometime after midnight, Lawrence confronted the would-be burglars. They fled, but not before firing at Lawrence. He died instantly. Suspicion fell upon one, quote, yellow Negro, quote, in particular. Some of you will already know him as Big Six. But a second Negro was implicated. And I need to pause here. I'm using Negro because it's the only word that appears in the newspaper accounts from which I have drawn almost all of the, most of this information. They are never referred to as men. They are never referred to as persons. We can't even infer their ages. 14, 18, 22, 36, we have no idea. So I am going to just use that term, Negro, and leave it in its dehumanizing effect. That's part of my opinion. Okay. Wanted notices were circulated the next morning with descriptions. One of the wanted persons was a, quote, large yellow Negro who carried a Winchester rifle, the other a small black Negro, also armed. Large numbers of armed white men combed the surrounding countryside. By evening, they had hauled both suspects back to town. A small group of citizens tried to send them by train to the jail in Columbiana for safekeeping, but the angry mob prevailed. And by the way, one of those who tried to prevent the lynching was apparently H.C. Reynolds, the first president of uh, the University of Montevallo. The two suspicioned Negroes were hanged that night. Their bodies may have been left to hang. I hate this, but look at your handout. Um, item number one there, I'm going to quote from the uh, newspaper. And, oops, do this too. Um, the newspaper article, which reads, Excitement over the murder of Mr. John Lawrence is this morning at an end. And notice the verb tenses, the present tenses. The forms of two Negroes hang stiff and stark from a limb not 50 yards from where Lawrence lost his life. The death of John Lawrence was a tragedy that was felt throughout the community. He was publicly and privately mourned. Thomas Fancher, a Bibb County diarist, recorded that he was a high-toned gentleman beloved by all who knew him. The Shelby Chronicle described him as an exemplary young man and universally liked and added, he leaves a young wife to mourn his untimely death. We know her name, Alma Viola Lawrence Nay Latham. We know that she remarried and in 1949 was buried in Clinton. Details on John and Alma Lawrence are fairly easily recovered. The two African American males who died left little mark in the historical record, however. We don't know their names, we don't know their families. We don't know their origins. Their lives didn't matter. It wouldn't have occurred to white folks to record whether they had wives or children, whether they were mourned by brothers, sisters, or friends. They were just lynched Negroes. There is some reason to believe they lived in a railroad camp some eight miles west of Montevallo and may not have been much known to the local black community. They seem to be, have been what were called strange Negroes. That is, and I'm quoting from a scholar here, blacks with no white to vouch for them, blacks with no reputation in their neighborhood, blacks without even other blacks to aid them. As such, they were particularly at risk at a time when an inflamed white community needed someone to punish. They died unaided and, until recently, pretty much forgotten. 
black lives didn't matter. It must be said, though, that one of the victims, the one dubbed Big Six in the press releases, did acquire something of a media profile as a known outlaw. He seems to have been part of an interracial gang, part black, part black, like, um, that bootleg, robbed, thieved, and quite possibly worse. In the days and months following the lynching, he was thrust into the role of a Negro desperado, a seriously badass character, said to be guilty of a string of heinous murders. And maybe he was. But we must be cautious before declaring guilt. The very nature of a lynching, and I'm quoting from a scholar here who studied many of the 4,400 lynchings, uh, the nature of a lynching made it practically impossible to get at the exact facts of the alleged crimes. Nearly every, in nearly every community with a lynching, a tradition of absolute guilt of the person lynched sprang up immediately and cut off all further legal investigation. The white press tended to assume the guilt of a lynched person and to stress their bad character. And this is exactly what we see in the accounts about Big Six. Uh, and you have one of those accounts, and I actually find this one kind of funny. Um, it, it furnishes, this is uh, number two on the handout. Yeah. Um, it furnishes a vivid, vivid illustration of Brian Stevenson's phrase about the presumption of dangerousness and guilt that, like iron to magnets, flies at men with dark skins. Think of criminals and rapists and so on, right? Um, consider the colorful, larger-than-life account of Big Six on your handout. He becomes a perfect Hercules. He was about six feet high, weighing about 200 pounds, well-muscled. In fact, a perfect Hercules and a walking arsenal. Besides his Winchester rifle, and blacks with rifles make whites really nervous at this time. Besides his Winchester rifle, he carried a sack of cartridges, bullet molds, lead, and powder. His record has been traced up, and it is learned that this is the fourth murder he has committed. He killed a Negro near Randolph last year, cutting him to pieces with a double fitted axe. He may or may not have cut a Negro to pieces last year, and he may or may not have been guilty of murdering John Lawrence, or indeed the string of murders later attributed to him. There was never an investigation, of course, or a proper trial. The newspaper accounts were conflicting. Some said he proclaimed his innocence to the end, others that he laid claim to at least one other murder before he died. The initial evidence against him, so far as I can tell, is that he was known to be something of an outlaw and had been seen near the store the day before the burglary. Standing at six feet or thereabouts and carrying a Winchester, he surely would have been a conspicuous presence on the Montevallo streets. But as for the murder itself, there were no eyewitnesses and everyone agreed that John Lawrence died instantly. If anyone besides Big Six and his deeply shadowed companion knew the truth, they weren't talking, at least not to anyone who was taking notes. So, you've met some of the people in the story. Now let's look at the setting. There are good reasons. The mob would choose a tree at the corner of Shelby and Broad or Main Streets. First, it was close to the scene of the crime not 40 or 50 yards from the place where Lawrence lost his life, as the papers like to repeat. And crime sites were often favored by lynching parties. It stood near the town's main thoroughfare and occupied the high point of the downtown area, which sloped gently downward along Main Street. The prominent location would have enhanced what today we might call the intended messaging of the event which we will get to in a moment. Keep in mind that lynchings were not, by and large, furtive, fly-by-night eruptions in swamps or woods. They were public events intended to draw white members of the community together. A lynching was an extra-legal punishment, as one scholar has put it, 
meted out by a group of people claiming to represent the will of the larger community and acting with the expectation of impunity. The locale served to affirm the communal nature of the punishment and also, as we shall now see, it served to send a warning. In 1889, a goodly number of the town's African-American citizens lived across Shoal Creek in the area that extends today from City Hall to Lucky's. These citizens would have had to have passed the lynching site on the way into town. The effect of the spectacle of two bodies hanging stiff and stark from the tree is hardly to be contemplated. According to a family tradition, the hats of the victims were left out on the gateposts as a warning to passers-by. Marshal Roy Cunningham, the great-grandson of a man who witnessed the lynching, reports that ropes were left hanging in the tree to warn any of the locals what would happen to them if anything similar were to occur in the future. Those ropes were still there some 18 years later if the oral tradition recorded by Eloise Moroni is to be trusted. It is unpleasant but necessary to confront the message delivered by the lynching, by the hats on the gatepost, and by those ropes left to hang. Their casually brutal assertion of the unlimited rights of white men and the absence of any rights on the part of any accused Negro was proclaimed. The Equal Justice Equal Justice Initiative, okay. EJI insists that we recognize that lynchings were acts of racial terror. Painful though it is to admit, the lynching that occurred here in Montevallo was clearly just that, an act of racial terror. Little wonder many people want to forget. Best not talk about it. But talk about it we must. Thank you, Deborah. Talk about it we must. And we need to ask ourselves as a community, how might we confront the lingering effects of the trauma inflicted on citizens of our town, black and white? We need to think about the things forgotten. Where do they go, the unremembered memories? If they were buried, were they buried alive? I will conclude by leaving you with a thought from the poet and activist James Weldon Johnson. More than a century ago, news of a horrific lynching prompted him to reflect thus on the race question. In large measure, he wrote, the race question involves the saving of black America's body and white America's soul. Thank you. As a, a, a final remark here, if there's anybody who would like to be on the Community Remembrance Project mailing list, I have a notepad here. Um, some of you all in this room are already on the mailing list. Uh, others who would like to be, please come up and give me your name. And if you have an email address, an email address. And if you don't, a home residence. Um, and I would also add on one side of the handout, there is, I, I think it's called Summary of Evidence um, for the Sighting of, of the, the, the Lynching Tree. This is, what I'm doing is a work in progress. Um, I'm trying to write as accurately as I can the history of this event. If any of you all in this room are local historians and you can correct, alter, add to, challenge any of the materials that I presented, I want to hear from you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give a big hand for Kathy King. I believe we have some time for questions or comments. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that um, the brothers' funeral 
Thank you, Patrick. Um, <coughs> well, you, you mentioned that these things the were never talked about, and that um, the infants only had one son. And, and did, did, I mean, was that a secret that that, that son was there also? I mean, was that no, 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 uh, I mean, Dan was Pippen, the family? I mean, was it, Dan yeah. Pippen was the only child of his parents. And so if you look on the uh, right. census report, you see his mother and father and Dan listed in 1930. No. This was 1930 census. I mean, would you, you had mentioned that the family didn't necessarily talk about the lynching except for uh, your mother talking about no, well, no, well, so no, about I'm talking about, I was talking about my family, mm -hmm. uh, even my cousins who are around my age, who at the funeral I was mentioning the lynching that occurred and they said, and that, they actually lived in the area, but they knew nothing about it because uh, I guess their parents just didn't say anything to them about it. And one of the things I have to say that my mother is probably the only living relative that remembers A.T. She's probably the only one, the only one I can think of. She's 93, so. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in right here because I want to read you about Dan Pippen. This is from the transcript. Um, you asked about Dan Pippen. He was only a, a young man, and he was the only child. And his father looked, went to the jail to look in on him. And this is a report from when he went to the jail to see his son. Um, after the officers arrested him, and he had been in jail for some time, Mr. DeGraffenried and Dan, meaning the father, Dan Sr., had come into Pippen's cell. Um, Mr. Pippen Sr. says, Mr. DeGraffenry told me to make Dan tell the truth. I said, son, tell Mr. DeGraffenry the truth. Dan Jr. said, Papa, I have told him the truth. I did not know that girl and did not kill her. I wasn't even there. I was working in the field. Mr. DeGraffenry left him with, with me for some time. After he was gone, my son cried and told me that they said he was going to be put to death. And he said, Papa, it's awful to die for something you don't know about. They have tried and tried to make me say I'm guilty, but they would kill me just the same. I don't want to die with a lie on my lips. I know they're going to kill me anyway, and if I was guilty, I would tell. Um, what was the reason why the little girl was killed, and do they know who <coughs> killed her? Well, there was some talk that after the lynchings, someone confessed. Someone confessed, someone that she knew. And it probably was the person who they looked at in the very beginning, but they decided not to go that route. She was a very poor girl, very poor. And it just looked like not really cared a lot about. So... Uh, the white person who actually killed her got away with murder. Um, Dr. Steelman, when he was 96 years old, gave an oral uh, report. Um, he was in the Truman administration, so they have it at the Truman Library, and you can read the transcript, and that's what caught my interest. When he was 96 years old, he could not stop talking about the lynching. They kept trying to get him to talk about Truman. And he kept going back. He talked about the murder and the white girl and that it wasn't any of the black young men. It wasn't. She had a bucket of flour and they, felt, they found the flour turned over. Um, but as Deborah said, she was from a very poor area. Um, I think I won't say anything, but Dr. Steelman mentioned who he thought killed her and it was a white person. Any other questions? Comments? Um, when did this stop? I mean, if it, if it stopped as a, I mean, as, as sort of an organized event. I mean, you, know, you said lynching was sort of a, meant to send a signal. I mean, when, when did this stop? 
Uh, the, the, from about 1880 to 1930 is known as the age of lynching. Um, I, I, I start losing track when we get into the 1930s, which is where Kathy and Deborah can take over. But um, my understanding is that, that we, beginning in the 20s or the 30s, maybe earlier, we had people who were doing serious investigations of lynchings, which didn't happen, obviously, in, in 1889. Uh, and there was considerable pressure on legislatures and, and sheriffs and uh, various sorts of law organizations to, hey, stop. And Kathy, I'm going to pass the mic on to Kathy because she can probably be more precise, but one of the points that Brian Stevenson and the, the people at the EJI will make is that, and this is really something to think about, one of the reasons that the number of lynchings decreased is, is because there was this kind of deal made uh, if you won't lynch, we'll be sure that they get the death sentence. And as lynchings began to decrease, you see the beginnings of um, the, the increased use of the death penalty and mass incarceration. And that's really where EJI is coming from on this. But as far as precise dates, I can't give it to you, but that's the tendency. Well, it may be useful, too. <coughs> in Mississippi, Mississippi in 1955 mm -hmm. as a kind of end point, mm -hmm. outright. There, the killers were arrested and were charged and were tried, but an all-white male jury found them innocent. A couple weeks later, they uh, confessed to William Bradford Dewey, uh, and the publicity nationwide for that particular crime, that particular lynch.